Okay, so let's have a. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is uh, Ming Liang. So uh, today I'll just be presenting about the uh, uh, two things. Uh, I mean, the second thing is that uh, if you have time. Uh, uh, the main thing I'm going to present today is a, talk, is a continuation from last week. So uh, last week we talked about likelihood models and we ended up around like autoregressive models. So this week I'll be presenting the part continuing from that, from where Prof Min left off. So we'll be talking about Continue models like MAST, uh, auto encoders for distributional estimation made, uh, pixel CNN, pixel CNN plus plus, gated C pixel CNN, and finally self attention, right? Uh, and if we have time, the second part uh, I would like to cover is a bit on lossless compression, right? So let's see, all right? So, uh, okay. Um, oops. Uh, how do Do I do this? Oh, ah, yeah. this. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So let's just move. Okay. So uh, before uh, I, I like so just just as a recap of what we did last week. So uh, last week we talked about what a generative, the purpose of a generative model. So the purpose of a generative model is that we want to learn basically this, right? We want to learn. Oops, uh, yeah. We want to learn this. We want to learn the probability density function. Why do we want to learn this? Because we hope that the probability density function over here represents the data generation process. How the data is, how the data is generated, right? Okay, so that's what we want to learn. So the thing about the probability density function is that we want to find, because we don't know like the exact probability uh, density function, right? Like beforehand, right, we're just given a training set. We do not know the exact distribution. We don't know the data, the data generation process. The point of machine learning is so that we can learn what this approximate, what this function is, right? So we were presented, we, we, were, we were given two ways of doing this. First, we were given the whole histogram way, the tabular way of doing it, right? And then we were presented with another way, right? The other way is using neural networks, all right? So the problem with the traditional tabular way, right, is that the problem with it is that it grows exponentially, right? With dimension, it grows exponentially. Yeah, it may work well with like, let's say, dices, like let's say with a die die, right, with only six faces, right? It's very easy to use a histogram to then estimate the probability that the uh, density function, right? Because you only got six things. But let's say you're doing something like an MNIST, right? The MNIST data set, right? It becomes like two to the power of 798, right? Because you've got 798 uh, pixels, and then you've got like each of them is uh, uh, one or zero in the, in the data set that they showed here. So it's two to the power of 798, lah. Uh, of course, you know, if you take the MNIST from TensorFlow, it's a bit different because it's like 0 to 255, but in the data set there, it's just 0 to 1. So it's 2 to the power of 798, right? So you can see, right, with dimension, right, the, the, as dimension increases for the tabular case, all right, for the tabular case, basically it grows exponentially, right? That's for the tabular case. So the thing is that we want to use a neural network to do a function approximation of this, right? So that we can get something better, right? So that's where we introduce this notion of function approximation, right? So we use a function approximation to do this. But the thing is that our function approximation, what the neural network must learn, is constraint. We have certain constraints that we need to follow, right? The neural network cannot just learn any old function, right? We have to learn specifically a probability density function. So what that means, what? So we can only must learn a probability density function, right? Density function, right? So what that means is that we are constrained, right? Uh, with a few things. The first and most important thing is that all our data points, right? Every, the, basically, when you, want to, when you sum up or integrate everything over the entire function, right? The probability density function, it needs to equal to one, right? It needs to equal to one. 
right? So that, that's one thing. That's one thing we're constrained by. And this constraint is very difficult. So we have to design models with keeping in mind that everything in the end, all our data points in round probability distribution, probability density function need to sum up to one, okay? And the second thing we need to do is that we need the log, because we are often, to, to, when we do a function approximation, oftentimes we are approximating something called a parametric, right? Uh, parametric models, right? Parametric models, right? Parametric models. So we estimate the parameters of our parametric, par, uh, parametric model theta, right? Using maximum likelihood, right? That's what we talked about last week. So the thing is that to calculate maximum likelihood, right? We need to calculate this thing called, as we shown last week, the log prob of the p, log probability, the negative log probability, right? So this thing needs to be easy to evaluate or rather more specifically tractable in the beginning, right? That there can exist function, probability density functions where this calculating the negative log likelihood, the negative log p is intractable altogether. And if it's intractable, right, you can't even do maximum likelihood, so you can't even learn your model. So we're basically constrained with two things. You're constrained with the probability, like everything needs to sum up to one, and you're constrained with a computational requirement that your probability density function, the negative log of your probability density function, needs to be tractable in the first place, okay? Okay, so one way of achieving both of these goals is the autoregressive framework, right? So we talked about the autoregressive framework, right? So uh, something like this, right? Yeah. In this case, they're usually turning it into an uh, RNN, right? So the idea of a, so let me just recap the idea of, a, so this is a simple two-dimensional case of a autoregressive model. So this is something you will see in this slide. It's a, it's a great example, but you may not really see this like in your, let's say your medium tutorial or your, what the papers you read, right? So oftentimes it's often expressed in the following way. So the tilde sign on top that represents bold, right? So really it just means a vector, starting from one all the way to xn, all right? So oftentimes we will rewrite our probability density uh, or regressive model as the following product, right? Uh, we have p, then we have x1, all right, then we have x2, x1, da, 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 all the way to like xn, xn minus 1, da, 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 x1, right? Or, some, or another notation that people might often write is that they might rewrite the following more conveniently as the following, right? You have x uh, i, right? So basically this x i thing just, uh, it's just an easy way of, sorry, uh, let me just, let me just paste that a bit more. Yeah. So they might rewrite it as the following thing, right? So this is just notational gravity, like it's just a short form of this whole, like you don't want to write xn1, xn minus 2, all the way to x1, right? So people might summarize it using a uh, smaller than i. So that, that's just notational gravity, but basically the same thing. So the way we got obtained this, the way we obtained this, all right, the way we obtained this, uh, Autoregressive. So this is what we call the autoregressive model. This whole thing is the autoregressive model, right? This is the whole thing, the autoregressive model. The way we obtain this is by manipulating, um, the manipulating the definitions of conditional probability. So for those of you who um, may have forgotten, there's a recap on math. So like we often define a conditional probability, right? Uh, we often define a conditional probability as the following statement, right? x2, x1, x1 intersection, x2, p, all right, of x1, right? Or in the slides, they will use something like a comma here to represent a joint distribution rather than an intersection, right? So if you just rearrange this, you can get back your autoregressive structure. Lah. So, yeah, so similarly, you can easily say that if we take like, let's say the x, two here to be the rest, you can easily derive the self back, the entire autoregressive model. So from the definitions of conditional probability, we easily get to this autoregressive formulation. So what's so special about this autoregressive formulation that makes it tractable and that makes it, uh, and that makes it sum to one. So obviously the summing to one is okay, it's quite, it's, it's quite uh, evident in the sense that yeah, you know you're multiplying, you're using the definition of probability in the beginning, you're not like creating something entirely new, so it's still okay. Uh, the second thing that you can make it tractable 
is that you notice that now you're dealing with conditional probability, right? You're dealing with conditional probability over here. You're dealing with conditional probability. So where do we see conditional probability at? Okay. We see conditional probability when we want to do conditional probability. We see it also in the case of supervised learning, right? So supervised learning, right? Basically, the problem formulation will usually be something like you got your target y and x, right? You have an x, then you learn some label y, right? So basically, we have kind of converted, interestingly enough, this problem of learning the PDF using the autographic regressive framework to become a series of uh, discriminative models, basically, supervised kind of ish models, right? Over here, basically, right? Which is a problem that we know how to solve, right? So, because we know how to solve this, you know, we can make it the whole thing. Uh, you can then do a, instead of doing a product, you can then make a log, right? After that, and then this becomes a sum. So, this whole problem becomes more tractable because we know very well how to do a negative log of a supervised model, right? That's something we do every day, right? When we do machine learning, we just do the cross entropy. You know, whatever tensor flow or Keras model, something like that. So that's a much more tractable problem, right? So we have reduced this huge problem, learn of, of generating models, and basically splitting them up into much more tractable problems that we can do and, and basically uh, get what we want from there. Right? So that, that's autoregressive models, all right? So far, this is just a recap of what we did last week, right? So this is what we did last week. Just to summarize, it's, uh, I mean, it's two hours, I'm trying my best to summarize two hours of content so that people can continue to follow on. So this is, what we, this is where we are so far, right? Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, do you need to review anything? It'll be, it'll be great now. Yeah, so it would be helpful if somebody in the room also tries to summarize what an auto-regressive model is. Yeah. It's helpful to restate it a couple times. Yeah, it's... <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Is there any questions? It's okay, like... Like, I know I'm a bit fast here because we're just reviewing. All right, there's no questions, I'll just move on. I just want to make a point that yeah. uh, one other aspect of that particular formulation yeah. is the conditional independence. Yeah, that's just, yeah, absolutely yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, it's oh. only come, uh, computing the two point oh. population much more tractable than this one. Part of uh, the part of making that observation that the key points of what we're doing uh, and the right. Yeah, right? that's true. Otherwise, the, the states will be wrong. That's correct. Yeah. So another point is basically, yeah, uh, as I uh, mentioned, uh, basically we want to factorize the space as well, right? Yeah. Okay. So now we'll move on. So basically, uh, one, uh, basically one of these, uh, yeah. So as I was saying, uh, basically tabular case, we see exponential time big O with the number of parameters growing exponentially, but with the case of the of our regressive, it's just O. Uh, it's just basically a linear, it's a linear case because you just have linear models instead. Yeah, in part due to the factorization. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's why we have this, that's why we see this speed up, right? That's why we see this speed up. Okay. So, uh, next, basically, we want to basically, we basically extend this model to uh, re recurrent neural networks. We can actually observe that this is really similar to, uh, this can really be easily extended to recurrent neural networks. And this was shown in this case. So we can end up with interesting models that generate text, right? So uh, we saw last week, we saw some cases like generating LaTeX and uh, math papers and articles like Paul Graham articles. So, yeah. so we can do all that things. So in this case, they're using something called character RNN. So yeah, we'll later talk about RNNs back when we talk about re uh, attention. So just keep this model in mind, but uh, as a recap, Basically, for those of you who don't know what a recurrent neural network is, so essentially, your multi-layer perceptron, your standard neural network, right, basically cannot capture sequences, right? It just, it just sees that input, that one input, and then moves on to another one, right? It doesn't capture this notion of a sequence, right? So for example, let's say you have a text, right? Let's say like, in this case, it would be, or in this case, characters, it would be hello, for example. It won't be able to like have one for, you wouldn't be able to transfer information. Let's say you put a, this was a, just a purely, uh, was just a standard neural network, a multi-layer perceptron, right? There would just be no, no connection. So everything will just be separated, right? So you just have one input, right? But with a recurrent neural network, what happens is that you, in sim, sim, to simply summarize, what happens is that you, you are able to transfer that information from one hidden state 
to the next hidden state. In other words, you have this property of being able to not only just look at where you are, but also look back. So you're able to have this con uh, idea of a, some kind of short-term memory involved. Okay? So we are now, and basically in the process, account for the context, right? Because we know language accounts for context. Sequences tend to have context. That's what a recurrent neural network has. All right? So I just want to keep in mind uh, this idea of an RNN. And like uh, R and R regressive models can be easily framed as an RNN. Okay, but we just keep this in mind when we talk to attention. Then we can see how it helps that. All right. So uh, finally, this is the end of basically like kind of like end of the so far what we recap so far. So now I'll just be talking about something called uh, something new called masking based auto regressive models. So so far, uh, the thing about auto regressive models when we observe when we look at this, right? is that if we want to, let's say, compute, there are two things with um, autoregressive models that I should, uh, or generic models, I should say, that we do. The first thing we do is that we do, if we, is that we try to estimate, right, the goal of, we, one of the, the two, user, two main users of our generative model is that we first hope to estimate likelihood, right? The second thing we hope to do is that we hope to generate new samples, right? We hope to generate new samples. So the thing is that if one looks at the autoregressive formulation over here, one notes that it's e when you want to, let's say, compute the likelihood, you need to first compute the marginal, the px basically, P px1. Then you can compute the conditional. Then you compute the next conditional all the way to the end, right? So you don't like, you cannot like paralyze it. It's a series, series, right? It's series, right? So that's, that's a limitation, right? So uh, that's one of the big problems. Uh, same thing in the generative process, right? So you want to generate samples, you also need to go in series, right? So the point of mask autoregressive models, uh, or what they call MATE, masking-based autoregressive models, MATE, is that it allows you to parallelize the computation so that at least for gen estimating likelihood, it becomes just a simple feedforward, all right? It just becomes a, a feedforward calculation in your neural network, right? So it becomes something like an O1 kind of thing here. Ish, right? O1-ish, right? Because matrix multiplication is uh, some, has a different ON. So assuming matrix multiplication is constant times O1-ish. So it's O1-ish, right? So that's that. Uh, so, uh, so how do they do this, right? So basically what they do is that they introduce this concept called masking. And this is a concept we will see occurring later on in other models. All right, so uh, is how many people are here are familiar with this thing called autoencoder first? An autoencoder. Yeah, let, let, let me just, you know, I need to explain what autoencoder is before. All right, so I think that most people are not so familiar with autoencoder. So let me explain what autoencoder is first. All right, so an autoencoder is a type of, like, basically you can think about it. Uh, in this case, it's a bit uh, weird because it's a bit big, but. Usually, an autoencoder looks something like this. It's kind of like a, a bow, right? It's kind of like a ribbon, right? So you see something like this. Usually, usually it's like this. What happens is that you take an original image, I over here, right? And then you squeeze it down to some kind of, hit, to a much smaller hidden state than the original, right? You squeeze it down. Then after that, you try to expand it out again, right? So it's like it's the whole idea of compression, right? You try to squeeze it and you try to decompress it, right? Of course, this is some kind of loss, lossy compression, uh, but you attempt to do it, right? So you try to have I here and you try to get back I out, all right? All right? So why do we want to do this, right? What's the point of getting a model to learn how to generate itself? The point here is the hidden, is this hidden unit, hidden, hidden units here. Basically, by trying to create a neural network that could efficiently do the following, that can efficiently get an image, uh, that can efficiently reconstruct an image after compressing it, we essentially forcing the neural network to learn a very good compression sequence. We have essentially forced the neural network to learn an underlying representation, right? This thing, right? So we hope to learn a good representation. So this is a good representation of our of i, right? Because we can, because we can now it's not only smaller than the original i, but we can also ideally reconstruct the original i from it, right? So this creates a very good representation of i, 
And because this is smaller than the original dimensions of I, you can, let's say, apply something else like a neuro, another type of neural network, for example, um, like other neural networks or models like King Earth's Neighbors or something like that. And also it helps alleviate the curse of dimensionality, right? Because now we have smaller dimensions. So it alleviates the curse of dimensionality, right? So that's a good thing, right? That's what we want. Right? That's what we hope to get anyway. Like, most of the time we don't get this, but we hope to get this. Okay? Uh, yeah. So that's the idea. So this model, this type of model, this type of model is what we call an autoencoder. Okay? It's an autoencoder. All right? So. Yeah. This is actually a really, really important concept for people like this. So, um, again, probably better if we work as a group to summarize and to talk about the technology. Uh, the pretty typical part of the group. But also, fine, we prefer the lecture mode rather than the discussion mode. Yeah, it's okay. It's free free to ask any questions about R and Code. If you any points to bring out, it'd be great because, like, I mean, I missed out some points because I'm trying to keep it consistent in a way or so. So that, bring it up, like, it's, it's fine. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So eventually, it's similar to like normal learning, right? What happens eventually, the loss will just kind of converge. You just kind of converge. And basically, you will. Uh, it's similar with deep learning, right? Eventually, you just stop at a certain epoch, right? After like maybe 10 epochs, you say, it's good enough, Let, let's end it here, right? So that's a common problem with machine learning in general, right? When to stop, right? Of course, you could stop, try to stop it earlier, right? That's called early stopping, right? So this tries to prevent overfitting. But uh, as far as I know, I don't think the, the literature has provided like really good uh, reviews on rules of thumbs. I mean, you can do some kind of, yeah. It also doesn't really make much sense to do some cross validation here. Lah. Yeah. But typically what will happen is that you kind of just once it converges, you kind of like stop. Right? So those are you who are ascribing or describing time sums. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you a basic question. We we don't make that bottleneck, right? So if we let all the input features pass through a layer of neurons that's the same size as Actually, another reason that's uh, maybe one is you might not be efficient. Uh, the problem with having a no bottleneck is you don't uh, allow the system to generalize. Right? Why do you think that is? Yeah. You'll learn an identity function, right? Basically, for each input node, you have a corresponding hint node, and because the output layer is the same size as the input layer, it's just going to pass all the information. Right? So the input on one node will go to the hidden layer node, the hidden layer node will just pass it directly to the output, and you'll get complete fidelity from input to output. Right? So that's great. That's the whole point of doing auto encoding, right? But it doesn't help you generalize. Basically, you're just saying whatever you get as input, just reflect it as output. Right? So the whole point of the squeeze, right? You're just trying to make the input that hidden dimension. Smaller and smaller and smaller to basically constrain a network to say, look, you have no choice. You can't pass all the information in exactly 100% replicated. You have to find some way of getting a semantic, some representation that's going to compress. Right? You're doing compression with that. And basically, when you uh, train that network, you'll be able to uh, replicate things on the output, even though it has less information. Right, just like we were talking about last week. If uh, you know, I if I tried to summarize what Ming Yang said, okay, I wouldn't use exactly the same wording. I have a semantic representation of what he said in my head, which is somehow much more compressed than the actual words. Okay, if I have a hidden layer that's the same size as the input, then I don't have to do any work. Right? I don't have to encode that information into a compact representation. Right? That's the whole point of autoencoding. It's like you need that bottleneck to achieve the compression. And by that compression, you're doing generalization. If you know the bias, you're going straight off the other things. So this is a, a 
a, a biased assumption that when we encode things in a small network, we're somehow trying to find regularities in the input. Okay. So I forgot to plug in the microphone. Uh, I'm gonna do that. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Just double check one other thing over here. Built-in microphone. Let's switch it to that. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Oh, okay. I have a point to make. Yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense what you're saying, right? I mean, historically, the data in the factor model has been used for a lot of data interaction. Kind of try to find the important factors that you want to model on. Kind of the same concept. Yeah. Then I was reading one of a little bit ahead of the flow model. Mm -hmm. It seems to not compress. It basically looks for a transformed representation of the original data with the same dimensionality and then do it back. So there seems to be a case in neural net where you're actually not necessarily reducing the dimensionality of the problem. You're just more interested in the transformation of the data. Probably to look at it in a way, maybe a better capture in uh, the maybe underlying structure of the data. Right. So, in that sense, like if I, because my always understanding has been that this is better, but it looks like there is a serious case of not actually reducing the dimensionality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, maybe when we come to that, we can probably. Yeah, that. I think we should revisit it when we come to the flow model, but just in general, when you have uh, a neural representation. One of the big problems that we have with neural representations is you take uh, any hidden unit and you don't know exactly what it represents, right? So when you try to analyze the dimensionality of your data and maybe disentangle it and put certain dimensions responsible for certain things, that can give you more of a, a semantic, uh, uh, a more transparent representation of the input uh, that aligns with our understanding. So last week we saw an application where, for example, you do some text generation and uh, somehow we're getting sentiment uh, for free, right? So we saw that. So some parts of the neurons are actually trying to capture that semantic regularity. And so what we were talking about flow models, I think is quite important to that, right? We may not be changing the dimensionality at all. So I mean, we're factorizing. The bottleneck structure in itself probably doesn't mean that. If you really draw, then it looks the same dimension, right? It's no longer coming down and going. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you are the same, yeah. you just look the same even yeah. there. So yeah. Even then, you are achieving something. So it's a kind of that. Because then there seems to be auto encoded to actually blow up or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, that is really interesting. Actually, I wanted to point that out. Uh, I want to talk about that. Like, but, oh, man, it's about 6 30, I kind of want to overflow. But I have a great block. So, like, your point, right, has a lot of topological, uh, topological significance. So, like, there's this amazing blog that talks about the relationship between topology and neural networks that I kind of want to talk, but then like, I only got 30, only got 30 minutes left. So I'm just going to like, write the link of the whole blog link here so that people can like, summarize it hopefully on the Slack group or something. Maybe you can just tell us what it is. All right, yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, I think it's called the, uh, it's by Cola. Uh, I think it's like topology and nanopore from neural networks and like that. Yeah, like it's by Cola. Like he's the guy who created like the LSTM. Uh, yeah, the LST <laughs> diagrams that you all may be very familiar with. Yeah, so he wrote this blog uh, back in 2015 about topology, manifolds, and neural networks, where he really discusses in depth the thing about the whole idea of transformation and the topological significance of this, especially in relation to this thick idea in topology called homeoisomorphisms. Right. The famous one of homo isomorphisms, if, although you are not so sure what that means, is the whole cup and donut thing, the switching between the two. Yeah, so like, he has an amazing blog about that. So I really recommend checking that blog out if you are really interested in this topic. I think Sunil just put the link on the screen. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, where was I? <laughs> okay. So, mass order encoders for distributional estimation, right? So, uh, basically, there's this thing uh, for mass auto, uh, auto encoder distribution estimation, right? You want to learn this auto regressive framework, right? So, how do you do this? So, the first thing is that you obviously, the first thing about auto, -regre auto regressive models, you don't want to look into the future. You don't want your x2 <laughs> into x3. You don't want to look into the future, right? Because that, that, that defeats the whole point of auto encoder in the first place. Uh, auto regressive models, sorry, in the first place, right? So what they do is that they prevent 
uh, the ability to look uh, back into the, uh, into the future, what they do is that they use uh, masking. They, they create these masks. These are examples of the mask. Right? So what they do is that let's say, or let's say the marginal distribution of X2, for example, the marginal distribution of X2, they just have one neuron, right? That is not related to anything, right? It's not related to anything. But this is our, you know, it's a pri our prior, right? So it can't be based on anything. So just X2, call it X2 over here, right? Then it will try to learn maybe something else, like let's say PX3, X2 over here, right? So this is dependent on the nodes X2, um, sorry, uh, X2 over here, X2. So like all the X2 stuff, you can see comes from X1 only. It doesn't come from anywhere else, but X, X1, which is the one, the one here, which corresponds to X2, right? Do you guys see that? Like this two come from all the ones and all the ones come from this one, which comes from here, right? Which is X2, right? It doesn't rely on anything else, right? So fulfilling like the whole idea of a conditional probability, X3 depends on X2 only. Then for this problem, then for this prob conditional probability x uh, x1 given x2 x3, right? You can see it only relies on x2 and x3, right? It only relies on x2 and x3, right? So that, that, that's how then they also create another mask for it. So what's the point of all this mask, right? The point of this mask is that now all you just need to do is the original neural network with this mask, so and with your inputs, you can go through one matrix multiplication and you can get the result. You can immediately know the likelihood of your model because after you, the result, you just sum and multiply everything out and you basically get your, or your likelihood there, right? So, so that, that's the good thing about this. So you now can calculate the likelihood of your given sample in a single pass, in a single forward pass, rather than going through multiple neural networks for each conditional probability to solve the original autoencoder case, right? Okay, that, so that's the key. Right? And you can actually reorder this. So this is quite messy, but when you implement it in TensorFlow, it becomes really neat. Like this whole masking is just what we call an upper triangular matrix. That's it, right? So it's really, really neat, like in TensorFlow, just an upper triangular matrix. Right? That's not difficult to create at all. Right, and then like I said, right, just multiply your parameters with the mask and your inputs together as a single feed forward, which is what they did over here, this net multiply, and you're done, right? You're done. You can easily estimate your likelihood, right? So they got interesting results because you can train longer on MNIST. So you can see this is the negative log likelihood. Later on, papers might write this phrase, NNL. It means the same thing. Like, I just want to elaborate on terminology because papers will interchange them, like, and you just, we may not know, and we may not tell you what NNL means. NNL means negative log likelihood. It's the same thing as here, right? So, uh, mate, as you can see, gets a good, uh, it's relatively okay. Like it's not the best. Like these are RBM, the type of autoencoder uh, called a restricted Boltzmann machine. And I believe DBM is deep belief uh, machines, right? Yeah. So network. Any DBN, right? DBN deep belief networks, right? Deep belief networks, right? Deep belief networks, right? So these are other competitive generative models. All right. They use similar concepts to what we're talking about, but they're not covered in the slides, so I'm not going to talk much about them. So RBM, DBM. So you can see it's like competitive with these other models. Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. Yeah, pretty good. All right. Uh, okay, but what is the problem with this mass RO encoder framework? All right. Problem is let's consider the second use case, right? Generation of new samples. If you want to generate a new sample, you literally have to look uh, you literally have to go back this whole serial process. You cannot generate a new sample by just looking at a feedball path. You have to calculate again uh, x2, go to x3, then x1, right? You, you generate a, a new sample. You cannot, you, you're still back to the serial process, right? So that, that's a sad part. But yeah, at least you have likelihoods. You can easily map, estimate likelihoods of this, right? That's good. All right. And so you can actually see the main results. So now they, this was, uh, I believe, the likelihood results test, but this is the when you do the sampling, right? So when you try to create a sample, when you do sampling here, I know it's a bit in the medium process, it's a bit, it, 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 and it's slow, but you know it still gets good results. So here are the samples. These are these are the originals, the original of here. So you can see that it kind of works, and yeah, it kind of works, and 
they did some nearest neighbors test to make sure like it doesn't it's not like too similar to the originals because oftentimes we are very worried that these models memorize the original data set so one way of ensure like measuring how much they memorize is by using some kind of nearest neighbor like if it's the nearest neighbor like is uh it's like zero then you know distance is like then you know that memorizing yeah Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're right in the first way. Yeah, you basically feed it like maybe uh, in this case it will usually be some kind of sampling usually involves some kind of noise. For those of you again, you usually sample with some kind of noise first. Then you sample from there. So that's why it does probably put some noise here, then you sample it once, then you feed it again, you sample it again, then you again feed something like that. Sample it again. Right. So that's what you said. How are the masks defined? Uh the masks are defined based on the fact that uh as I mentioned, right, the point of the mask is to avoid seeing into the future. So the masks are defined based on what your, uh, like, let's say X2, right, what you want, what is your conditional probability. So in X2, you can see here, nothing is, it's not relying on anything, nothing in the condition, there's nothing conditioned on here. So you masked out everything else. Oh, uh, yeah, just do some kind of like upper triangular matrix generator. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, it's totally random, but like usually you'll define it using some kind of upper triangular matrix. Then that one you just design yourself. It's, it's uh, defined like uh, it's something that needs some heuristic, right? Like you no, need no, to design it. No, as in this of formula of itself is something you come up from the math. Then, then you design from the given what prop conditional properties you need, you then design a corresponding upper triangular matrix. Like this is just all from the formula itself. Then after that, you just create the upper triangular matrix. Yeah. Yeah. This, so this. If you have a full upper triangular matrix, basically all the uh, available edges are connected, right? Because you, you have to have one variable that's unconditionally uh, accepted, right? In our, in our yep. uh, topology, yep. it was X2, right? X2 in the right hand side is not connected to anything on the output. Right? So when you run a forward pass, X2 will just get some random variable, uh, random value because it's unconnected, right? Then on the next pass uh, through your forward network, you put the value of X2 at the bottom, right? And you forward propagate all the way through the network, and you will have found X3, right? Because X3 here only depends on X2 value. But all the edges are structured with upper triangular matrix such that there will only be directed edges that go to X3 dependent on value. Okay. And then on the third pass through this toy uh, problem, we will have established X2 and X3's value. If we pass it all the way through, we'll get the final X1, right? Because here it says the probability of X1 is conditional on the joint probability of X2 and X3, but we already have X2 and X3 from the first two forward passes, right? So what uh, Ming Liang was saying from the upper triangular matrix is that any permutation of that upper triangular matrix will be you know, randomly destroy once basically take out edges is a valid version of an upper triangular matrix, yeah. right? So we, we can, uh, as Taha was saying, we can just randomly decide which edges we want in our network, as long as we still have this configuration yeah. on the output where uh, P2, uh, sorry, X2 is not conditionally dependent on anything. X3 is only conditional on X2, and X1 is conditionally independent, uh, dependent on everything. So you are saying there are two, one is x1, x2, x3, right? So we define a particular dependent structure, yep. that's basically what these things, right? And then you decide a mask which represents that particular configuration. Yeah. Yes. Right? So and then you train it. I was just thinking, I mean, because then it says there's nothing unique about the choice of dependency testing. The joint distribution generally right. doesn't favor one configuration. <coughs> Unless you have some prior knowledge. Unless you know yeah. some knowledge right. about the structure. Yeah. Right. Right. You just want to basically have a mask that avoids seeing in the future. That's exactly. That point. That's it. Does that mean, like, if I, I mean, in terms of training, uh, yes. if I train it like with the upper triangular matrix, it's exactly x3, it might be x1, x2, x3, or, you know, based on the first one, and yeah. x1, x2, right? Right. 
can I rotate it like later and go in? I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, in a sense, I can train parallel models at some point and see some of the or like try different. Yeah, you can try different dependency structures here. Sure. Like, it doesn't necessarily need the upper triangle the matrix. So as long you change the tri upper triangle rather than change actually the input sequence, you actually change ah. the rows of the upper triangle sequence. And the sequence of how you actually do it. Mm. I guess because if I change just the order of the rows, it's still an upper triangle matrix. Right? Mm -hmm. But then now I'm kind of changing essentially the dependency. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess you could do it either way. The, the Rather way that than the lecture said is like for sequence format. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Right. Right. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, and yes, your sequence format you can is uh the choice of the sequence format. That it's a good question. Like how what what are the choice of the sequence format? So later we will see with pixel CNN that choice kind of matters for images at least. Uh. Yeah. yeah, right. But that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Right. So uh, meet and stuff. Then all right. Okay, so uh, okay. so just to uh, just recap a little bit, I know Mika wants to go. No, because I <laughs> yeah, I know you have a lot of slides to go through. So just to be clear about this, uh, this type of network is very fast for infinite, but very slow for sampling. Right? Are we all clear about why that is? It should be very clear in your head why that is, because you can do one fourth pass through infinite. Right? You have a, a state, you just want to find out how likely it is. Pass it through, you get all the variable life in right? one shot. Okay. But to sample a new point, you have to recurse all the time through the network until you sample all the variables because we have this conditional uh, uh, distribution. Right? Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. So uh, thinking on this, I sorry, thinking on this idea uh, further, right? Or this idea of uh, auto regression models. There's another auto regression models. There's so we stop at images here. So there's another high auto regressive models here. In this case, they are using. You can apply this whole idea of, from multi-layer perceptrons, which we are talking about here. Multi-layer perceptrons. You can take this idea of masking and apply it to something like convolution, right? In this case, a one D convolution, and this forms the basis of something of a very famous model called WaveNet, right? WaveNet. So WaveNet is how is the currently I think the state of the art for generating uh, speech speech synthesis. And it's really important, this problem is really important because you know you can use speech synthesis to like generate politicians and create fake news. So like the really important problem that people are looking into, right? Speech synthesis, right? So but we are talking about one part of WaveNet, and in this case, the idea of the mass uh, convolu convolution here. So uh, typical convolution uh, will look something like this, right? Uh, in this case, they, they spread out, so it's a bit different from your usual like. 2D convolution, so 1D convolution. So this part over here is what we call the receptive field. The receptive field, right? This is the part of the, the, the entire part the convolution sees and what the output over here will depend on, all right? The output here will be dependent on. So you can already see a bit of the problem here. This is kind of XI, yeah, like, like you know, this XI. That kind of depends on itself, this kind of thing, right? So that's a bit weird, right? So, so you want to, and of course, another problem is that it also is a, has a limited receptive field, but right? you can see it only covers here, right? So let's tackle the limited receptive field first. So in the problem of limited receptive field, we can see that well, you only see a very small part of the input to determine the output, right? WaveNet solution to this, all right, it is supposed to be a GIF, by the way, like this, this thing is supposed to be a GIF over here, but it's not playing, it doesn't matter, all right? So basically what happens is that with WaveNet, what happens is that your output over here is dependent. They, they have this thing called, they use something called dilated convolution. And the idea of a dilated convolution is that instead of sampling the things immediately around it, they sample one here, then they skip this and they move on. They skip this and they move on to that, right? So that's the idea. So they skip, then after that, you just, uh, like once more, you can just uh, do something like this. Right, right. Then you then you can do it, expand this a bit more now. Go on, right. And you can expand it a bit more, right. So so what you get is something like a, right. So what what you get is something like a, this. X. You can see your receptive field is a bit wider now. Right, it's a bit wider. So the receptive field encompasses a larger area. Right, not seeing only inputs near each other, 
it's seeing input that are a bit further away from each other, right? So it's seeing further back in time, right? So this idea of having a space there is called the, it's called a dilated, uh, dilated convolution. Uh, this is just to represent the idea. This uh, I don't, I'm not even hundred percent sure whether the arrows here are all correct, but yeah, yeah no. but it's huh? yeah, no. they're not right. Anyway, like something like I like this doesn't look right. Like, but anyway, the concept is there, right? The whole idea that they're spaced out a bit more. That, that's the key central idea that they, they, they should be taken note of, all, right? Um, yeah, this actually is very similar to like people using signal processing like sampling rates. So like you can think about this as having like a lower sampling frequency when you do dilation, when you have more dilated uh, composition, right? Yeah. So like maybe like how they might determine, like one good way of like determining for at least audio wise, like how you might determine like a good dilation rate to begin with, is that since this is related to sampling frequency, you might use like things like the niche Shannon's theorem, for example, to like determine like how roughly, how, where, where, where the sampling frequency rate should be, right? Right, so that's that. So uh, let's wait net. Okay, this is the idea of wave net uh, dilated. So of course they extend this to have a bit, the, the idea of masking involved to prevent you from looking at the features. So what they might do is they might not look at this, prevent like dilation from like seeing in the future because it's kind of, right. Hi, can I ask a question? Yes. Oh, can you all hear me? Huh? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh great, okay. So my question is what are the inputs in wave net? The inputs in WaveNet, yeah. So, uh, if in the case of let's say training base, there will be audio samples themselves. So there will be like, for example, the uh, volume of the uh, like the audio sample like MP3 plus and plus like. Yeah. So we are not like using like inputting like a male spectrogram or anything like that. We're just using audio samples directly. The waveforms basically. So we are using some wave file. Okay, cool. No, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. That's very helpful. Yeah, I've got to get a few pieces. That's why I'm not All right, cool. All right. So, yeah, so audio samples are generated and inputted both as wave files. So, that basically directly the audio audio information does like directly get in. All right. Uh, of course, sampling process is linear because of auto regressive model. So, you can see wave net. Uh, yeah, it's auto regressive, so it's sampling, linear sampling. So unfortunately, right, if you let's say one to like create your own <coughs> synthesis of Donald Trump, they're gonna like take hours to do it. Like right? for even like one minute of his of his speech patterns, right? You got like one hour, you spend like hours just getting one one minute. Because it's, it's a long process. And these are huge models. So it's gonna take a while. Okay? So yeah, they then of course similarly you can do some kind of masking, right? I think you just do some kind of similar matrix multiplication. Uh, in this case, they implemented as some kind of uh, padding instead of some kind of masking kernel. So that's one key difference. So, so you can pad the, the thing off instead of use the, something like the original mate where they put a mask, um, a mask matrix there. Okay, so that's one thing. That's one implementation of detail that's important. Oh, this came by this one? Oh, uh, right. So, uh, the padding itself, because uh, I never actually implemented it myself, so I'm not 100% fully sure, but you can just deconstruct slowly, I guess. So, like, this part over here, padding that bit, right? So, it tends to be two types of padding. Uh, the same and it's valid. So this just tends to flow. So valid means by default we want no padding. So that means but we don't want the default padding to exist anymore. So no padding. So yeah, no padding. So that's because we want to have our own padding pattern here. So that's why we have no valid here. So same padding might be something for let's say you want to have the same dimension output. Right? Because as you know, convolution down samples. So you want to make sure that the final sample has the same dimensions as the original sample. So by putting valid, uh, by padding same, then you have the same dimensions as the output. Alright? So, over here, um, there are a few parts. So, uh, uh -huh. 
So first of all, you have your kernels. So your kernel represents, as they state over here, your convolution weights that you're learning from your model. Okay? And then there's a second part over here, which is the most important one, the pattern X, right? So this is X, right? Because um, I'm not 100% sure if TensorFlow, even though I'm wearing a TensorFlow shirt. I switched to high torch, by the way, guys. High torch is superior. Okay. <laughs> high torch is superior, right? It's ironic that I'm wearing a TensorFlow, but I kind of almost forgot the most of the TensorFlow. Right, but <laughs> it's, it's ironic. I used to collect TensorFlow too. Right, so uh, anybody knows enough TensorFlow to read this? I am kind of like not 100% sure about TensorFlow anymore, like not too confident on the current syntax. Okay. Let, let, let us scribes try to take this and, and tackle it while, while you lecture. Yeah, like this is a tensible syntax thing, like I'm not too sure anymore, sadly. Am I right, right? Yeah. Um. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, next part, right? So that's uh, mass, uh, mass, uh, sorry, uh, mass temporal convolution. I'm going to move a bit forward faster for the yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, you want to have a larger receptive. You don't want to look further back in time rather than very deep in time. So you can see now I'm looking much further back in time. I'm looking at the further point in time rather than in the beginning. So why you might do that is because all your samples, right, they have the property where things near it tend to be quite similar, but things further around it might be a bit more different. So you want to capture more in different information, right? So you might want to look you might not be so interested in the neural parts, so you can skip the neural parts and look further back in time. So dilated convolutions make this sacrifice. You look further back in time by skipping some of the parts in between. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, you, though you lose a bit of information near you, you capture things globally better, right? So that's the idea. All right, so let me quickly move up. So uh, basically we have uh, pixel CNN now. So, oh yeah, this is another auto right, encoder. So this one, um, Again, uses the autoencoder framework. So the idea of pixel CNN is basically you have the same autoencoder, except now this is your X1, then this is your X2. So you go step by step, right? So you can let's say again use the auto encoder, auto regressive model, sorry, auto regressive model equation here. So you can still use the auto regressive model equation to then generate it step by step. So you apply an auto regressive model step by step to generate each single pixel. So like an OTV, right? So you just generate one line by pixel by pixel line by line, right? So, um, as you were saying, right, this is not the only possible uh, pattern, you know, there's like other possible patterns. And we'll later see that uh, later on. But this is one of the patterns, and this is the pattern they use for this very important model back in 20, uh, I believe 2016 or something, uh, called Pixel CNN, right? It's just one of those things. So they call this uh, ordering a raster scan, right? A raster scan ordering. So you can think about it like an old style TV. Right, old style CRT TV, they go line by line by line. So, a similar thing, you're just generating the image line by line by line here, except using some kind of network now. Okay, okay, so uh, the thing is that how do we then uh, learn it? All right, so you can, of course, to do it to make it to make sure it obeys this all regressive model because with this kind of thing, you will apply 2D convolution for those of you for those of you familiar with convolution, it'll be a square thing, right. So how do you get these things like this kind of weird edge here, right? This is kind of weird. This is not really a square. You can't really make a square do this, right? So that's why you apply the idea of masking back again, right? So you mask out to get something like an L shape kind of thing, like those Tetris L shape things, except rotated 90 degrees, right? So Tetris. So something like this, right? So then you you use this masking in your convolution to make it obey this auto regressive uh, model. Uh, ordering, right? Or regressive ordering, so it doesn't look into the future again. Okay. Yeah. So, but as a result of this, of this, of, of this masking, you lose some information, right? You create this kind of blind spot because this L is not, you know, for those of you who know play Tetris, right? This L cannot like just, it's always this shape, right? You can fit it in every single plane on the Tetris uh, board, right? So you're going to have some parts where you can't fit. So these are the parts that you can't fit, and, and that's where these blind spots in the receptive field appear. Places where you cannot fix at all, right? So this part is not even captured at all in the model, right? So that's a problem. So there's a blind spot. 
because you can't see these parts with this sort of mass convolution. So uh, come 2016, I guess, there was a paper called Gated Pixel CNN, all right, that talks about uh, basically two stream convolutions. So what are the two stream? The first stream is called the vertical stream. The second stream is called the horizontal stream. Okay, horizontal stream, all right? So the vertical stream sees this part over here, the part on top of the current row, and the horizontal stream sees the part horizontal parts before the point. So the point we're generating is here, so it, it sees it this part. So it, the vertical stream will see the top, the horizontal stream sees the bottom, right? The part before it, right? So you can, uh, sorry, so you can create this sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, this also is supposed to be an animation, but that's not playing yet. That's fine. So yeah, so but basically you want to combine these two, how you combine, right? So that's where the whole gated idea comes in. So you can combine these two things using something like an LSTM gate, right? LSTM gate, where you have, um, yeah, where you can just combine these two inputs using some kind of pancake and sigmoid, okay? So this is really similar to like, those of you who know LSTMs, uh, LSTM is a type of RNNs, it's called long short term memory, right? It relies on this concept called gate, which allows you to combine information on the various parts of the sequence. So they use this thing called a gated, uh, this idea of gates, to combine the vertical and the horizontal step together to generate out the current output. Okay? Yeah. Okay? So they do, but to implement it on CNNs, they basically use modified ResNet lab because obviously it's not, a, it's not a RNN, right? So you modified it by modifying the ResNet blocks. Okay? okay. So did, did these get good results, right? Because now you're able to like, avoid the whole problem of the blind spot, right? So you can see quite good results here. So this is why I told you NNL, right? So this is the negative log likelihood. That's the notation comes back in, NNL. So you can see NNL is pretty uh, low. So lower the better, right? So yeah, you can see. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, so come uh, more recent models. For example, Pixel CNN plus plus. So uh, this model is again, it's introduced by, uh, yeah, I believe, Andre Kopati, I think he wrote this paper uh, back in 2017, yeah, archive, right? So uh, Pixel CNN++, right? So, so far all these models that we're talking about, right? The outputs they give, right? At the end of the day, why usually, uh, in this case, not really, but like for example, Pixel CNN or Ritual Pixel CNN, the output, you want to get a two, 200, you want to get 255, zero 255, values for the pixels, right? What you do is that you apply it to some kind of softmax. All right, softmax. So softmax is a type of activation function, okay? So the activation function looks something like this. Uh, looks something like this. So this is E, X, I, over I, over here, then right? Okay, over here, all right? So this is something like, this. how softmax is written out. So what is the problem with softmax, right? The problem with softmax is that this part is very expensive. All right, this part is very expensive to calculate. Especially like those of you who do like NLP, like not these images, but NLP, right? You have the huge vocabularies, right? So vocabularies, this thing is massive. So you end up with all sorts of tricks, like hierarchical softmax, all sorts of tricks. Right, but this part is expensive, even for our, our 0 255 case, right? So this part is expensive to calculate. So one suggestion on this paper, Pixel CNN Plus, is that instead of using softmax, let's use logistic, logistical distribution, right? So this is basically the logistic distribution. Okay. People familiar with the logistic distribution here? Are like anybody not familiar with the logistic distribution? Like logistic regression. Right, just recap it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So basically the logistic regression basically have this idea of a logit over here. Logit over here. And then you basically have some kind of linear model over there, right? Linear model over here. Right? So basically you create a linear model to basically approximate what we call the logit function over here. Alright. Basically, that's one way of thinking about it. At least when I read the step, step 
books that are learned data, the logistic regression. <coughs> yeah. So anyway, it's another type of uh, it's one is a one is another type. Uh, so when you do everything here, you'll get something called a logistic function. Yeah, and it models this thing called a logistic distribution very well. Okay. Uh, so basically, using the logistic uh distribution, so you end up with something quite like the sigmoid. And um, actually, you end up with something really like yeah, the sigmoid. You know, something like that, right? So you can see, oops. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, okay, not my, it's fine. I'm not so sure what happened. All right. Whatever it is, you end up with something like this. So the thing is that this will be one, and this part will be zero over here, right? So what happens over here is that, you can see this is like um, there are a few reasons why this is good uh, instead of uh, instead of your softmax. One of the reasons is the computational efficiency, and the second reason is the fact that with softmax because you're using this from zero to two five five, right? You don't have any notion that one nine let's say pixel one nine nine and one nine uh, one nine seven over here, right? And one and two hundred. <coughs> One nine eight, I guess. <coughs> Two hundred and one, for example. That, that these are quite similar than compared to let's say something like one hundred, right? You have no way. So the model needs to learn that pixel hundred, right, is further away than pixel one nine seven, one nine nine, two hundred and one. But by forcing everything to this kind of real using a continuous function like this, you can model that much more easily, right? So these are the two reasons. So computational efficiency and uh, in an inductive bias to learn the ordering better. All right. So that's that the uh, logistic distribution. So yes, you get something like this. The CDF is basically a sigmoid. Yeah. So according to yeah, sigmoid. Right. So then they also, because of this, uh, this one way to the computational efficiency for the outputs. So it also uh, there's some other ad additions to this that allow you to then basically capture long-term dependencies more efficiently, right? Yeah. So these are the so basically this constitutes the whole pixel CNN family, right? So you basically you see pixel CNN, you see additions like the gate CNN, uh, big data pixel CNN, and then you see things like the pixel CNN plus plus, right? So these are the things happening, right? But now I'm going to talk a bit bit exceeding time, but um, on this, so you can see pixel CNN superior performance on this thing called attention, right? Because I think like I want to spend more time on this because actually because like a lot of people have tried to explain attention over and over again with this class. But I talk about attention here. So attention idea, it's actually quite an old idea, it came from uh, the first time I was introduced, I think it was 2015 back then, 2014, 2015, around there. And it was applied to this model at the time called sequence model. All right, sequence sequence model, right? So the idea of a sequence to sequence model is that you have two parts. All right. You have two parts. The first part is called your encoder. And your second part is called your decoder. All right. Encoder and your decoder, right? So the problem with uh, sequence to sequence so far is that you can see, so maybe these are what we call RNN. So this is an RNN over here. So the thing about the RNNs here is that with an RNN, you're transferring information from the past states to get to the, to the current state, right? So information is definitely going to be lost, right? Information is lost because you will forget, you know, your new stuff will override the old stuff, right? So you have this problem of being unable to basically capture long term dependencies, which is the recurring problem, as you can see, with mass auto and <coughs> models of. RNNs in general, you, you can't. It's very important to capture long-term dependencies, but oftentimes you can't. So, uh, sequence sequence suffer from the same problem, and there's an information bottleneck over here. Basically, what happens here is that you have all this information in encoder state. So this can be a trans. Let's say a translation task. Let's say you're translating like, like a, let's say by character like hello, like okay, hello with holding. And then you translate it back into some other language, right? Right. Basically, you're forcing this entire, uh, all your past things to be now compressed into like one, two hundred dimension, maybe, maybe even smaller, maybe a hundred dimension vector, hoping that everything captures one hundred characters of text. 
100 vector, vector, 100 dimension vector captures the 100 characters of text. Toss it into the decoder and hope it decodes reasonable translations. So yeah, obviously like, you're gonna lose information in something that small. So one solution to this was the attention idea. So the idea of attention is this, is the central idea is the idea of importance weights. Important weights. So what happens over here is that every time you have your vector over here, every time you get your vector over here, every time you get your vector over here, okay, you get your vector. So this is the original. I'm just copying it, right? There's no changes, no new extra neural network. So this arrow is different from here, where you get like maybe some tangent. Here. This is exactly a copy of the original hidden state. So this is called hidden states. Right, the original state of the model, we're just copying it up here for clarity's sake. What happens here is that you want to have, you want to know, given this current input, let's say you're trying to decode maybe the first character of the translation model, you want to, you want to know on top of the information you get from the RNN, it's part, it's part of the bottleneck over here, you want to look back at all the other previous characters, right? But obviously you don't want to count every single character the same, right? Not every character is as important when you're doing a translation, right? Not every character is the same importance. So you want to create a weight. You want to weight it up. You want to apply some kind of weight over here, often represented as alpha. Alpha over here. You want to apply a weight on the individual hidden state vectors to tell which one hidden state is more important, right? Which one should you account when you're trying to decode the first character, right? You don't want to count everything. Everything is not the same, right? So one solution to doing this, one very simple way of doing this, is that they basically, um, one of the key papers, which is what self-attention uses, is that they basically apply a dot product. So this state here, this is the, let's say the decoder, the state dh over here, they basically apply a dot product of dh onto every single hidden state here, all right? So by applying it to every single hidden state, so what's the point of a dot product, right? So dot product, you get two vectors, right, over there. So of course, you can, you can use it to measure cosine angle, right? Basically, cosine similarity, right? So that's the idea they're using. They apply a dot product of every single hidden state vector, and as a result of this, they can then apply some kind of soft next to basically get some kind of important measure, right? Because basically, the things that are similar here, you're basically saying, things that are similar here, are probably the ones you want to kind of look at. The things that are not so similar, you don't really want to look at them, right? So it'll be like this, right? This will be like EH here, and you might maybe multiply dot product with, with the original. Uh, yeah, I know like vectors usually are kind of small letter, but you know, just for, <laughs> just for speed's sake, right? I'm just saying, you guys should know that this is a vector. Then this part over here, maybe it's our hidden state over here, right? Then maybe you can apply some kind of basically some kind of soft max, right? So some kind of soft max, right? Then after that, you just apply some kind of soft max, right? So let's first put S, right? Soft max. Then this will basically give you the importance at maybe this point, right? So you just repeat this process for every single point, and you basically get the importance weight for every single hidden state of your hidden state of the encoder factor. So you got importance weighting of every single hidden state of the encoder, right? So you know which one is important now in your encoder, which hidden state is important, which one is not important, right? So you combine these pieces of information with this, and then your information you get over here, you finally do the prediction. So the thing is that because you are also looking back at all this original stuff, right? You are no longer like throwing out excess information over here. You have, the, you have the ability to now look at more information when you're doing, deciding on the translation, right? And of course, you don't look at everything because you just look at parts where you, where you attend to very areas of higher importance, right? So you can see the idea of this importance is just to some dot product and some soft maths, okay? Now, the thing about this is that you can imagine, you can reformulate this whole idea, this idea as a kind of key value pair uh, idea, all right? So you can imagine dh your as uh, your query, all right? And these parts over here, as these parts where you do the dot product as your keys, all right? As your keys. 
and the underlying uh, hidden state over here as your value. All right. So this is the central idea behind self attention. Oh, so this is basically a, by the way, this is softmax. So this was basically what we did, right? This is now the well, softmax for every single one, and you sometimes some. Yeah, basically that's what we just did. Uh, okay, but basically self attention takes this to a whole new level. So this is not the self attention formula. The proper one would be uh, you apply your softmax over here, right? And then after that you just put dh, and then you put your hidden state over here, your original hidden state square root d, right? Then it's d. So this will be your value, value, right? So this will be your original hidden state, or in transformers, uh, attention all you need. It could be something else, right? It could be different embedding. Then this part over here will be a dh, right? So this will be a decoder hidden state, and h will be your original encoder hidden state. So the encoder and decoder hidden states are pretty similar, right? Then we know, okay, this part is probably important, all right? So what happens, why, why is this square root d? It represents the dimension, uh, the dimension of your vector. So what they have found is that as the dimension grows with your, your hidden state dimension grows, right? It kind of biases the model, kind of biases the attention a bit more. So they correct this bias using a square root d, square root d, to kind of, base, to kind of prevent the, the dot product, the values of the dot product from getting too big. Right, because you know this is just a dot product, right? It's like we didn't even like it's not cosine similarity at all. So this is unnormalized, right? It's unnormalized. So you can think of this. Uh, so of course, if your as your magnitude of the individual vectors, you know, magnitude of the vector will naturally increase with more dimensions because you know your values in your dimensions will obviously, you know, you know will obviously increase with squared, right? So what happens that dh uh, dh dot product h right naturally increase as your more dimensions. So what happens is that why it biases that with a larger value of your cosine, your, co your, your dot product has a larger value, dot product has a larger value, softmax and sigma uh, has this thing called a, uh, as you grow, grow up, the grains become smaller, right? So this is the graph, right? So the problem is that as your dot product becomes bigger in value, as you grow in more dimensions, you are basically in the region of your softmax that has smaller gradients. And we know neural networks require gradients to learn. So you have smaller gradients, you can't learn, so you get bad results. So that's how the bias happens. So because you want to, the problem arises because you have larger dimensions. So what you do is then just normalize it using this square root d. So that's what they found, square root d. So the full formula is like softmax, dot product of d of the decoder hidden state and the original hidden state of the encoder divided by square root d multiplied by the, the value, which is in this case the decoder or the encoder hidden states, and you can get your attention, right? This is the idea of attention, right? So, of course, we are doing this across like rhythm decoder. So, of course, your that your keys, your that sorry, your queries, in this case, your queries, need not arise from the decoder at all. So, this is what's going to come. The decoder does not need to arise from the, the queries does not need to arise from the decoder. The queries themselves can actually come from the, from a single network, let's say the encoder part, can actually come from the encoder. So, if it comes from the same network, that is the idea of the whole self attention, right? Because we have talked about key in terms of you can generalize it in a key query and value. So then you are not restricted to having an understanding in terms of the decoder here. You can actually use part of the encoder as your query here. So you can change this dh here to some part of your original encoder. All right. So you can do something like this now, right? You can change it to some part of the original input, right? So now instead, your receptive field is no longer limited by finite size. You basically have unlimited, your receptive field is not unlimited. You can capture everything now, right? That's great. Of course, then you, of course, the problem of capturing everything is that you break the autoregressive uh, ordering, and that's where the masking comes in all over again. So, yeah. So then you have masked attention, right? You have preserved the autoregressive ordering, so you introduce masked atten attention. I think you have to apply the masking function there. So with that, right, you can end up with some interesting, uh, like I said, like you said, right, the auto encoder ordering does not need to be like the raster, the raster ordering, right? It doesn't need to go line by line. It can actually go uh, this way, like a diagonal zigzag way. That's one possible way as well, right? Uh, and there's also actually other ways. So let me just move to the other ways. So like other ways will include things like this, that you could do this way. So these are the reason why you want to do something like this is you want to do a 
So you, you, with different orderings, you can get different speed ups. So you can convert your linear ordering to a more like log e. So you can get speed ups with the different order, progressive orderings. Can you explain that image again? Oh, this one? <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, so what does one, two, three, and four? Yeah, sure. So uh, in this case, we basically the how it how it does is that you want to break up the auto regressive ordering, all right, using uh these ideas. Uh, you want to break up the auto regressive ordering so you can do parallel, you can run things in parallel, right? So uh, you can basically do this kind of parallelizing within a group. So like I think like these one, two. Stuff, I think they are referring to the different groups, right? So you're like maybe running these two at the same time, but you might want to double check on that. Like I'm not, I'm not too sure about what these one, one, two means. Other than the fact that the central idea we mentioned in the lecture here is just to change the auto regressive patterning such that you can do parallelizing more efficiently, so that you can then, um, <clears throat> so that you can basically run the auto regressive models faster, right? Because I think what it means is, uh, let's pretend we have four, four computation units, right? So the first task, we get the uh, sample the values for uh, those four pixels on the left, right? Yeah. So I have a value for those four pixels after the first uh, four tasks, yeah. right? Then because I have those four, I can go ahead and calculate um, for the same four processors, right? I can assign them each of the number two pixels, right? Because I have the uh, uh, basis for the, uh, their values based on the selection area, the directed arrows, right? So if I have all the, the dependent one variable and then uh, calculate uh, the two, right? Then the same would be for right? So basically, after four passes, you have the entire an image uh, right? you have to do this raster scan or that diagonal scan that you saw. Okay. Okay. So, uh, part so you can see the mass attention results. So of course you apply this on convolutions. You're not rejected. Uh, so you can get you can see with with a mass attention you can see much larger receptive fields, right? So like you can see basically cap. So these gray a purple areas here is where the input determines the output. So with data pixels here, you can see yeah, uh, it actually sees a much more very Local small region to determine the output. Then pixel CNA, you see a larger region. Pixel CN plus, you see a larger region, but still not ideal, doesn't capture everything. Then with mass attention and convolution, right, you can really see, right, this thing captures almost everything, right, before this point. And it incorporates everything to create the output, right? So you can see that that's the advantage with this unlimited receptive field. Yeah, you can, you can basically combine that to get a larger. To get a better output there, right? So of course, yes, the of course always the best, better performance, right? So this way. Yeah. So again, I believe the units here are in negative log likelihood yeah. units, right? So uh, finally, basically, with the summarize about the advantage and disadvantage of our regressive models, basically the good thing about them is that they are very uh, fast. I'm uh, sorry, very expressive, meaning they can express a lot of your data, right? They are also reasonable at generalizing and they have really, really good negative uh, negative log likelihood scores. Like they are really good at getting this. So because they're really good at getting this, a lot of people have been applying these all regressive models for in areas such as compression and things like that. Right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, multiple data and yeah, modalities, right? Different types of data as well. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. But of course the limitation, even though you have all this, is that they're really slow because you're still sampling is still kind of serial, even if you can change the auto regressive ordering to solve in parallel, it's still kind of limited. So there have been a lot of different ways of doing it. Like one way wave uh, parallel wave net has been trying to do, I believe, and also in the fixed CNN literature, is that they have been trying to cache parameters out, cache parameters, right? So that's what I've been doing to by caching, you know, you don't need to compute and stuff like that. So they have achieved some speed up using this. So yeah. So that is the current state of the whole autoregressive uh, models, neural autoregressive models so far. So now with this, I'll pass my time to uh, Eugene here, who are talking about flow models. All right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh,
questions so far? Are we all comfortable with what uh, we have uh, covered for for the first part? Okay, let's give a hand to Eugene, who's going to do the second half. So all of you listening, uh, you'll get your chance but the nice thing for you is you have less lecture duties. Uh, fortunately, our two gentlemen going today, they have to take a whole lecture by themselves, right? Those of you assigned for the, the subsequent lectures, you have a little bit more manpower, if you will, to, uh, to delegate responsibility. All right. Um, hi. I might overrun a bit because I prepared and powerful material as well. Um, okay, so let's start. Right, so we have talked about different kind of autoregressive models so far that actually deals with discrete space, right? So it is from all the autoregressive models that you see just now, the output is usually going to be some probabilities that it takes on uh, one of a finite number of model values, right? So now what we're going to do is we are we're going to extend this into variables. Okay. So let's start with this. So the idea, okay, let's let's see. Right. So the idea is um, instead of is someone talking? Okay. Crap. Right. So instead of trying to come up with a discrete um, probabilities at the end, we're going to output a kind of a density. Right. So how do we do that? Um, is everyone here familiar with something called the Gaussian mixture model? Gaussian mixture model? Anyone is not familiar with it. All right, okay, let me just Gaussian mixture model. So the idea of Gaussian mixture model is very simple, right? So what you want to do is to come up with the distributions that have a mixture of multiple Gaussians. Right. So think about about what you need in order for this mixture model, right? You, you have maybe one Gaussian here, another Gaussian here, um, and maybe maybe one more Gaussian here, so on and so forth, right? Let's say you have k number of Gaussians, then how many parameters do you need to fully describe this distribution, right? So let's think about it, right? We need the means of this one, e one, we need the mean of this, we need the mean of this, so it depends on how many Gaussians you have, that's k number of different means that you need to define. And if we imagine this to be just a one dimensional problem, then we also need um, k number of different variants, right? So the total number of parameters you need for this particular model, um, at the very least, is 2k, right? That would define all the different Gaussians. After you have this 2k, you also need to define which of these Gaussians does your sample come from. Okay, so imagine the sampling process. Um, if you want to sample from this Gaussian mixture, what you will do is you will probably choose a Gaussian first. You have K Gaussians, you choose a Gaussian, and then you go to that Gaussian, you sample from that distribution, right? Sample from the particular Gaussian. So what that means is that you need another K parameters, um, more specifically K minus one parameters, to describe what is the probability of choosing Gaussian i, from i equals one to k, right? So as you can see, so this will be the final model. The final model is very simple, it's very interpretable. Um, you have a mixture of Gaussian. This pi is going to be the, this, this is going to be a categorical. This is going to be categorical. So pi i sums up to one, right? These are the probability that you choose the k Gaussian. Then you have this normal part that is another 2k number of parameters that will decide 
how you want to sample from a particular Gaussian distribution. Okay, so essentially this is the Gaussian distribution. And if you have taken something like a machine learning call before, you will know that one way to train a mixture of Gaussian is just by using expectation maximization, right? So we're not going to go through that. Uh, we're not going to go through that. But in general, the idea here is that in order for you to come up with a continuous distribution at the end, what you need is to parameterize your distribution and output the parameters of that distribution. Okay, this is crucial. So what that means for us is that we want to train maybe a network that will output them. In this particular case, we're going to train a network that outputs, say, the mean and the variance of your distribution. So your distribution is no longer categorical. It's going to be um, a density of some sort. So you have to define what is your prior distribution. Okay, that's essential. Okay, so um, now let's think about what we want to do at the end. So what we are trying to do here is likelihood models. We are trying to model um, P data. Right? This is the distribution of your data set. Now, we can't fully describe this P data all the time. So we are going to find an estimate to do this. P theta, right? We're going to train some stuff, um, tune some parameters for data, so that we get P theta to be close to P data. Right? That's the goal of it. So one of the ways to do this is to do what we call the maximum likelihood which is exactly what we've been doing so far, right? We are trying to, um, rather, we are trying to choose a particular parameter set, theta, such that theta is actually going to maximize the likelihoods that you see your data, right? So this is essentially the idea, okay? Um, so how are we gonna do that? Okay, so the simplest way to do this is whatever I just described, but there's a very interesting class of way to do this called normalizing flows. Okay, so this is exactly uh, what we're going to talk about now. Uh, so for normalizing flows, what you essentially want to do is to map your distribution from something very complicated, which is your P data, into something very simple, which is something like a normal distribution, right? So imagine you can do that, right? How would you sample from this? How would you sample from this? Any ideas? Right, okay, so if you want to sample from this, if you want to sample something from a very complicated distribution, you just simply have to train that normalizing flow and then sample from that single distribution and then do the inverse to it. Okay, maybe I jump ahead too much, but uh, we'll see this idea flash out in more detail. Okay. Um, what I want to do before we get into normalizing flow is to do some mathematics for you know. I want an empty spot. Okay, great. Empty spot. So let's talk about two mathematical concepts before we go on. Okay. First, let's talk about Jacobian. Who have not heard of Jacobian? Or rather, who have heard of Jacobian? Right, so everyone else is in a quantum state of not hearing about Jacobian. Okay, let's talk about Jacobian, right? So suppose you have one function. Some function x that will output some vector, right? In other words, f is a function from Rn to Rn. Okay. So one concrete example of such a function might be something like uh, f of x1, x2, x3 is equal to maybe uh, of course maybe x1 plus x2, x2 plus x3 uh, sine x1, something like that, right? So it's a it's a it's a function that maps from a vector to a vector. Okay, so the Jacobian is just basically a matrix that is defined this way. F, X, F, X, F, X, and so on and so forth, right? Get the idea, right? 
So what is the significance of this particular matrix? Does anyone know? Any idea? All right, okay, so, yeah. It's a gradient of the function. Yeah, it's the gradient of the function, right? So essentially this part will tell us how much does F changes our input by in all possible directions. We respect to all possible inputs, okay? All possible dimensions of the input, right? So that is clear. Any question? This is pretty basic for those who are using neural networks so you need to know about dimension coordinates and gradients. Yeah. Whatever it is, right? Okay. Um, I think I want crystal clear on that. That needs to be there. That, that is really... Okay. Okay. If you're not, uh, come and talk with us after the lecture. We'd be happy to explain it again. Oh. So um, the next important concept <coughs> I really want to focus on is determinants. So determinant, it's an idea for matrix, right? So if you can talk about a determinant of a particular matrix. But what I really want to talk about is what is the geometric interpretation of a determinant? Okay, so let's talk about, let's take a concrete matrix, right? Let's take A. Um, perhaps let's try 2, 0, 0, 3. Okay. Determinant is 6, of course, obviously. Um, but let's see where the 6 comes into play. So let us draw a simple grid uh, with a vector, let's see, any other thing. Right, let's say we have a vector, which is 1, 0 here and another vector, which is 0, 1 here, okay? Let's just concentrate on the 1, 0 vector first. So if you apply this vector to this matrix, what do you get? You get 2, 0, right? You get 2, 0, let's see from here. So you get 2, 0. So what happened is that this particular thing has expanded in size to two zero. Similarly, if you look at the zero one, what is a times zero one? It's zero three, right? So you have this particular thing right here, zero three. So essentially, if you think about this, this is a this a is basically going to transform your your system in a very linear fashion, right? So every Thing here, if you imagine there's a grid here, this grid will be angular. Maybe I use the right color. Right? So this grid right here, this rectangle defined by this 0, 1, 1, 0, will be expanded into this rectangle. And what's the size increase of this rectangle? It's six times, which is the determinant. Okay. So in in general, the whole idea of determinants, um, one at least one geometric interpretation of determinant is how much it shrink or expand space. Okay, and that's crucial for us later when we talk about a change of distribution, okay? Um, is that clear? Is this clear? Okay, cool, right. So let's go back to normalizing flow. So what exactly is normalizing flow? Uh, let's see. Just Get an empty. Oh, uh, okay, not my empty sense. I'll end the doing one by one right now. All oh, right. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, not ideal, but let's. Okay. So now, what is normalizing flow? Um, we already talked about it that we have some very complicated distribution, right? This is the complicated distribution that we want to um, obtain. Okay, 
And we hope that through some set of data from this P data, we can recreate this distribution. Okay. So the idea of normalizing flow is actually going to be this. We are trying to transform this distribution into a simple distribution. Say, for example, this is normal distribution, right? By some function. To see how we can do this, let's imagine this. Suppose we have a random variable x. Uh, suppose we have a random variable z that is normally distributed from 0, 1. Okay, let's apply a very simple function. Let's square this random variable and consider z squared. What is the distribution of this one? Anyone knows the distribution of z squared? Chi it's a chi square, right? It's chi square or degree freedom. So, <laughs> so just by squaring something, you already get a very different distribution. Okay, and that's the that's the key. What we're going to do is that we're going to just apply some function to our original distribution, so that to our original random variable that has some distribution, so that when we apply this function to that random variable, that resulting random variable is going to have a very simple distribution, right? So if we apply f to some random variable x, where x is distributed by this, we get z, which is just a normal distribution in some case, right? We, we can change z to whatever we want. We can make it a uniform distribution from 0, 1, or anything, right? Just some very simple distribution, okay? So that is the key idea of normalizing flow. And we're going to see what kind of problems does normalizing flows um, surface. So let's think about the big picture first. There are two things we want to do with our generative model, right? To train the generative model, we need to do inference. And in order to, uh, well, after you get a generative model, you want to do sampling, right? So you want to be able to sample. So let's see how we do both of these. So first, let's think about inference. How easy is an inference in this case? Uh, how do we find the probability that you could obtain some data? Let's say you already have that, right? Any idea? What do you guys think? So firstly, you need to sample by using Z, and then after that, you need to like, apply inverse action to get the... Um, so I guess what you're thinking is sampling percent, right? So that's the other way around, right? Yeah, you're right. And, okay, for sampling, you're right, right? What you want to do is to sample from this other distribution and then just apply the inverse of this to get, to get this, right? To get, to get your sample. What well, about the other way around? How do you do inference to get the likelihood of getting some sort of data? Right? Let's say I give you some x. How do you know the probability of x? Part of it is it related to the left side or the right side? You're given the next and you need the probability of x. Are you guys completely lost or is it just like too obvious? Or which one is it? I mean, it could be either one and off the spectrum. Can you, can you speak up a little louder? Yes, but how do we... We don't really have this distribution, right? This is something that we want to trade. So, how do you get this distribution? How do you... Yeah, how do you get this distribution? So, one idea is very simple, right? If you have some x, what you're going to do is you just apply f to that, and then you get into this domain, and then that just tells us what's the probability of getting that particular thing, right? Um, more concretely, you want this to be a CDF so that it tells you exactly what's the um, cumulative distribution of that particular thing, right? So essentially, that's that, right? The easy way is to just have x, apply f to it, and see what is this thing, where do you land on this? Okay, this will give you P of X. Okay, clear. <laughs> so the two things are clear. Inference, get an X, apply F, 
look at this PDF of this. Do sampling, sample from a, un, a, a normal distribution for this case, apply the inverse of F, and then you get this particular thing. And then you're done. Okay? Basically, in the generative models, we are looking at those two specific problems, right? You want to sample, which means I want to create a new data point, right? And I want to do inference. I want to know how likely a data point is, right? right? So if I've given a sentence or an image, I want to find out how likely that's generated by the model. And the sampling is to, to hallucinate a new data point, right? To create a deep fake, uh, create a new piece of text, etc. Okay, so those are our two functions. And basically, uh, Eugene is walking through how you're using it, doing that at an abstract level, right? And so it has to do with this, this function F in the middle, which we're trying to take from the data, the data distribution into a, a, a nice uh, um, other distribution, which has nice distributional properties like a normal function, normal distribution function. You guys are really quiet, so I hope you guys will discuss. If you have any questions, please speak up because you guys are all eventually having to do projects in this area, right? If you don't know the basis for it, uh, it could be a little bit difficult, right? Okay. okay, so now with all the mathematical tools and with that problem that we already discussed, let us think about what are the potential problems of having a normalizing flow. Right. First of all, we say that f is going to be some arbitrary function. Right. We hope that f can be an arbitrary function that will transform you into this simple domain. Okay. So the problem is when you're sampling, you need f inverse. But how? Let's say you're going to train a neural network. How are you going to get the inverse for that neural network? That's going to be a problem. Right. So we need somehow, we need some way that we can train, maybe constrain the network in such a way that we are able to get an inverse for that network, right? If the network is F, we want to be able to get F inverse. So that's hard. Uh, let's think about ways to do that. The second problem is that when we are training this particular model, we're going to do maximum likelihood, right? So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to maximize um, the log of P of X, right? Now, but what is this P of X? P of X, P of X is actually going to be a change of variable from Z, right? So P of X, imagine you have two distributions, right? Imagine you have X, and imagine you have F of X, and you know the distribution of F of X, know the distribution of this, know the distribution. How do you get the distribution of X? How do you get P of X? Right? Suppose we know what is P of F of X. How do we get P of X? Right? So if you have taken, say, a probability course before, you might have seen this particular formula, right? This particular formula. P of X is just P of Z times the, the determinant of, the, of, of your Jacobian, right? But why is this formula like that? I want to spend some time to talk about this particular formula, right? So Let's just break down this formula. Let's see the big picture of this formula first. What is this formula trying to do? We have, we want to find the probability <coughs> of x. Okay. We have the z. We have f of x, right? We have f of x. Oh, yeah, we have f of x. We have this. And by having this, how do we transform it such that we get p of x? Okay. So just a little bit of recap, f of x could be something simple like a normal distribution. So you know p of f of x could just be a normal distribution, okay? But you, do, you also know f of x. f of x is just a neural network for this case. So how do you transform p of f of x into p of x? Well, this just basically goes back to the idea of graphing your space, right? So imagine, let's say you have a uniform distribution from 0, 1. OK, and let's say this variable is called z. What is the distribution of 2z? It's going to be 
zero to but shorter, right? You want the you want the total area to sum up one, right? You want this total area to sum up one. So the area, the height has to go short, right? The probability density for each of the points is one. So essentially, because of the constraint that the integral of this whole probability distribution have to be equal to one, the space essentially shrinks, right? So we talk about shrinking space before. We talk about what F, what the Jacobian is, right? Jacobian tells you how much the space actually, uh, well, uh, you want to erase everything, right? No, I just want to do it. Okay. <laughs> right, so, so essentially the Jacobian tells you how much does each of the space change with respect to each other dimension of the space, okay? And, but what we're interested in is how much does the aerial change? But how do you get the aerial? Well, we already saw that, right? Determinant is basically the thing that you need to do. You have a transformation. The transformation is the Jacobian matrix. If I want to know how much does this transformer change your aerial space, you just take a determinant of that, that Jacobian. That's about it, right? Um, one caveat is that if you just take the determinant, it might be negative because the space might be changed uh, in a separate direction. So just take the absolute value of it. And you get this formula. Yay, right? It's a very simple idea. Okay. So here it shows us the second problem. In order to train our our, our network, we need to do a maximum likelihood, right? We have to do this max log of P of X. That means we need to get P of X. But P of X have this really oh come on, determinant and Jacobian, right? It's gonna be a problem again. Right. How do you get, how do you even solve this thing if, you, if your L is a neural network? Okay. So this is another thing that we have to be careful of when we design our normalizing flow. Okay. So we're going to see what kind of trick we can do such that we can design a network that is easy to invert, that has simple determinant, or, and also have simple Jacobian. Or maybe they have a simple determinant of the Jacobian. Either one of them is fine. Okay, so we're gonna see how we can do that. So how do we do that? Hmm. Um, let's talk about the simplest possible flow. Okay, so the simplest possible flow we can have is the affine flow. Um, do you know what affine means? Affine is actually just a fancy word for it's not a fancy word, but it's a it's a more open. It's linear but with a bias. Right? When we talk about linear, we always, we actually just mean AX. When we talk about affine, we just mean that we have a plus B. Yay, okay. So a fine flow is basically a flow that is defined to be this way, okay? Um, Z again is some simple distribution, so normal distribution here. And then we just try to find what A and B is. Let's try to train what A and B could possibly be, right? And hopefully at the end of the day, Z, the, uh, by, by transforming a random variable with this particular function, you get an x that is close to your distribution. Okay, that is uh, that is the hope, um, and this is this is good, right? Um, because this transformation, the Jacobian is actually really simple. The Jacobian of f, uh, sorry, this is f, so this is inverse of f. Okay, um, so the Jacobian of f is actually really simple. It's just a inverse, right? If you look at this. The Jacobian is basically just this, which is, well, if you imagine your classic single variate calculus, uh, the only thing you're differentiating is x, so b is a constant, it goes away, so you get a inverse, right? Some easy way to see it. Um, so it's simple, right? We have that. Um, the problem is inverse of a matrix is also not easy to find. It's O and Q. So that might be a problem also. Um, so let's think about other ways to do it. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Before we go into the other way, uh, I also want to talk about trying to calculate the determinant. So we say that Jacobian is simple, it's just A inverse. But what about a determinant of A? If we restrict our A to something simple, then the determinant is easy to find. Do you know what the simple thing is? What kind of matrix, what kind of general n by matrix are very simple to find? Sorry? Triangular, right? Triangular. What's the determinant of a triangular matrix? 
just a product of diagonal, right? So if we can design our A such that it's just a diagonal matrix, a triangular matrix, then this is sweet, right? You can find a determinant, you can find a Jacobian, all is good. Okay, so one way that we can enforce this is to just basically say that um, each of this dimension, right? The, the, okay, so we're just gonna define a function add. We're just gonna define a function add such that we're gonna transform each of this dimension just by the dimension itself. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, so what you essentially want to do is that you want to transform add of x1, x2, x3. Well, to transform this particular thing, we just define three different separate independent functions. So that this is equals to some function, maybe g of x1, h of x2, uh, a of x3. Right? So we just transform each of the dimensions separately. Right? This is this is an inductive bias going on here, right? Because in general, our function could our function could allow us to transform maybe the first dimension um, with a combination of this tree, right? Maybe this particular thing could be x1 plus x2 plus x3. But now we are restricting such that your first dimension can only rely on your first dimension of the the second dimension of the output can only rely on the second dimension of the output, and so on and so forth, right? So now we restrict our function into a very particular space. And this is great, why? Right? Because the Jacobian of this thing, it's really simple. It's a diagonal matrix, okay? Why is this a diagonal matrix? Um, how about you tell me, why is this a diagonal matrix? Sorry? Yeah. Is it because the function f, so if you don't know, if you take the first one, mm -hmm. it's basically a zero, zero for x to x two. So the first one would be uh, g of x, g of x, so this one would be zero, each x two would be zero, zero, zero. Yes, exactly. So essentially, if I write out the Jacobian matrix in full, that's exactly what. Uh, so the Jacobian matrix is this is n of x one, uh, n of x two, f two of x one, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, yeah, I get it wrong. Here. Okay. So, hmm. so essentially, you can see that because the first dimension only relies on the first dimension, so this is non-zero. But the second dimension does not rely on the first dimension. So this is zero. So everywhere is zero, except the diagonal, because only the i dimension relies on the i dimension. Yay, right? So we have a very simple Jacobian and a very simple determinant for that Jacobian, because this is diagonal matrix. So it's just the product of all of the entries, or of the particular simple one dimension. And what you can do is you can just set all these things to be applying, uh, applying flow, and then you can speed. Okay, right. Any question for this? Okay, cool. Uh, so, so far, element wise, flow really be uh, you know each element is transforming separately. Right, so that maybe by design of, of the function that you want an upper diagonal matrix so that you can get a determinant with uh, very little complexity. They're making all those problems easy. Yeah, over there. In the slides are all the add data with the same function. Um, the or the add data. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it seems like they are making the same function. If you look at the slides, I think in general you could. How about you rotate it just like that? Sorry. I thought you rotate just like you go on page. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're right. So I guess in general you could have different functions you want. I don't see a problem with that. But yeah, in the slide, it's the same function. Let's discuss this. Yeah, sorry? Yeah, that's the thing, right? What is what do you all think? <laughs> Could we have different functions? It's easier to what? Mm. Code wise, given this much, then to the right. 
Yeah, I guess so. Could be because it's simpler to do it that way. Deep learning is generally <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, but I think mathematically speaking, it's possible we just use the friend function. Um, yeah. So we can check whether that's possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah we, we obviously need to be able to replicate the, the function on each variable so that it, not, it may not be actually feasible to share the same function. Mm. But we can check on that. Yeah. There are two parts to that. There's a function and the parameters of the function. Correct. And we can keep the function as long as same for different yeah. parameters. Right, right. So the hyper, mm -hmm. the, the parameters data will change for every, change and for every part, for every element of the function. The data in this case could just be, if you are using a fine flows, it's just going to be A and B, right? Yeah. So, okay. Let's go to the interesting part. This is a really interesting, this is really cool. Uh, real MVP, right? So, Again, let's start from fresh again. What we're doing is we want to get something that has easy to compute determinant, Jaco determinant of the Jacobian and it's invertible. Okay, so this is another approach to do it. The approach goes like this, right? We have our input, which is x1 all the way to d, right? D dimensional inputs. What we're going to do is we're going to split into two. Let's imagine this is our input. We're going to split into two, and we have the first part, and then we have the second part, right? Two parts. Okay, so this is x1 to d over 2, and this is x d over 2 plus 1 to d. Okay, so what we're going to do is the function that we're going to apply, the function f that we're going to apply, will map this thing to itself. We're not going to change it, we're just going to leave it as it is. So this is x1 d over 2. Okay, but the second part, which is this portion, we're going to change a bit. We're going to apply this affine uh, function to this. But this affine uh, function is a bit different, right? Where your actually this parameters, your, your transformer, this, this thing, and your, your bias term is going to be trained as a neural network, right? They are parameterized by something, okay? So they are parameterized by something, okay? We're going to output this as our new z d over 2 to d. Okay? But uh, remember this z, z d over Okay. So the first part is going to be the same as the first part. We're not going to change the first half. But the second half, we're going to apply some function that depends on the first half. That's it. This is very magical, right? Very magical. But let's do some mathematical. Um, let's do some mathematical analysis and see what we get for the determinant. Okay. Um, Cool thing is that, well, let's think about the top left, right? The top left is going to be identity. Why? Why is it identity? You're not changing anything, right? You're just, you're just putting, you're just taking whatever the input is and let it be the output. So that's identity, right? That's fine. Um, this bottom right is going to be complicated. Okay? This bottom right is going to be complicated. It's going to be the derivative of um, so essentially what you want is to get the derivative of uh, d of z some calculated value over d of x1, d of z, d over 2, over d of x plus 1, x1, so on and so forth, right? So these this are hard to get. And in general, there's no structure to it. But the good thing is that we can ignore it, okay? You'll see why later. Okay, so this particular part, this particular part is the, uh, it's just a diagonal of this, right? Why is that so? Why is this so, right? This is the derivative of something in the lower, lower part, or let's say we have d of c um, k over d of c j, right? Where this k and j is in the lower triangular part of things, okay? So it means that it's in this particular situation. Right? But in this particular situation, 
here z, z over d of x given to z. It's a very simple, it's a very simple quantity. It's basically just this particular portion, right? Just imagine your one-dimensional single very calculus thing. You are taking the derivative of this with respect to this, so it's just this. Right? Okay. So what you get is uh, basically s data of whatever it is inside. So that's that. And you put it into the diagonal matrix and then you have your answer. Okay. So why is this a good thing? What what this this is not a good thing, but why is this a good thing in general? <laughs> the determinant is simple, right? The determinant is really simple, it's just going to be the diagonal. This is diagonal, this is diagonal, so this is lower triangular. And lower triangular means that the determinant of it is just the product of the diagonal, right? So in, 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 in particular, the product, the determinant of this is just going to be the product of all the diagonal of this part. Because the identity is all one, so one times one is still one. But in the bottom part, somehow you just take the product of all the diagonals, and then you get this thing. Cool, right? So again, we get the determinant of the Jacobian. This is the Jacobian, just like that. Okay. So these are a few way, different ways that we can actually um, train normalizing flows. Uh, and if you see here, the cool part about here is that where is the part where you're trained? You have to train data, right? So data actually comes in at two different portions. You this particular portion and this particular portion. And it turns out that you know you can just train a free-form neural network with that. And a neural network without any constraint. Just train it normally. Okay, and this will be all fine. So that's the cool part about real MVP. Real MVP. Um, any questions? Sorry. Train one that to perform the two function. Well, I mean, that's not a problem, I guess. Um, you could just that's a decision to try, right? You're just constraining your neural net to. You're just introducing inductive bias to a neural net if you let it be the same function, right? Why is it separate? Um, why is it separate function? Because you want it more expressive power, I guess. That's generally always the reason, right? There's no reason to think that this and this should be the same. So let's make it different, and then let's hope that neural net do its magic and gives you the right function. I guess. So, yeah. Mm. What do you mean by symmetric? So in this case, I'm splitting the variable into half. Right? Yes. If I create a different way, like the reverse. Then... You're exactly great. Okay. This, this, well, this will answer the question, right? How do we split it? In general, it's an art, right? It depends on your problem. Uh, you want to split it in such a way that you maximize mutual information between the, the things that you uh, fix and the things that you train in through the internet. So in general, well, if it's an image to maximize the mutual information, maybe you could just do a checker box way, right? So this pixel, this pixel one probably depends on pixel two. Pixel two, five probably depends on pixel six, and so and so forth. So the yeah, mutual information is quite huge. That that could be a good way to train, right? That could be a good way to partition it. Yeah. But in general, it's an art, right? It depends on your problem. Okay, um, some results. You should have seen it in the lecture. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, so what I want to do, um, I, I believe that you have already watched the lecture, right? Okay, so what I want to do is to discuss one of the recent paper that has uh, released. So the idea of that paper is to train something for, uh, let's see, do I have an empty space? Oh. Do you have an app that can draw? Um, 
So this will be quick. I'll try to end it in five minutes. So there's this recent paper called, um, there's this recent paper that has this idea of trying to train a monotonic function. So you know that like, sometimes if you go into like the different of neural networks, you always talk about how to train constrained neural networks, right? Maybe neural networks that output the distribution, something you can do by using a softmax at the end. Uh, maybe you want to, or neural net to output just positive values, right? How would you do that? Maybe you put an exponential function at the end or absolute at the end. But here, what we are interested in is to train a neural net that outputs a monotonic function. So do you remember what the monotonic function is? Okay, it's just a strictly, okay. It's a strictly increasing or decreasing function, right? Uh, so this is a monotonic function, right? This is a monotonic function. This is a monotonic function. Right. So it's always increasing. And we are only concerned with strictly monotonic in this case. So that means we don't want functions like uh, this that has some flat surface, right? We want strictly increasing. So how do you train a neural network that is strictly increasing? Just a little puzzle. How would you train anything that is strictly increasing? Thing to do with derivative. Any ideas? What if you don't train a neural network to output a function itself, but train a related quantity? Yeah, you train the first derivative, and then you constrain the first derivative to be positive. Right, so that's a neat trick. So the neat trick is this: if you train, oh, ah, oh, what? Wow. Okay. So the neat trick is that if you train a free-form neural network to output the derivative, and then you constrain it such that this output is positive, then you take the integral of this you get a monotonic function. And that's the idea. And why is a monotonic function good in our case? A monotonic function is invertible, right? That's exactly what we need in this case. Okay. Um, I will refer you to the paper. Maybe I'll just pose it into the slide. I forget the, I think it's called, um, unconstrained monotonic neural networks or something. You can check out the paper. It's actually very cool. Uh, yeah, I guess we are running out of time. Let's end it today. Yeah. Yeah, okay. let's end it today. Right, so let's give a big round of applause. <laughs>